We know that in all stages of our lives, we will make decisions that will profoundly impact or influence the future of the people we are trying to become. Through those changes in our lives, we will experience change in our preferences. It will transform our values, and it will even reshape our personalities. Since change is inevitable, I have to ask how then we can remain ourselves grounded. How can we be certain of a strong future? Does it even exist? How do we see ourselves in the future? Where is our trust for a strong future? What are our goals, our dreams? What are we afraid of in the future? That's what we're going to be talking this morning. Amen? So I want to um, invite you into this conversation since we've been talking about this new vision of a strong foundation, and now we're going to tackle our strong future. And in order to do that, I would like to invite you to revisit a very known story of a person in the Bible of the name Joshua. Joshua is a book in the Bible over there, if you didn't know. Uh, it's comprised by 24 chapters, which I read yesterday. If you haven't done that, that's your homework for today. Luckily for you, there's no um, game tonight, or is it? I hope not. So please go ahead and do that, and, and, and it'll be a good experience for you. So the first chapter of the book talks about the promises God gave or God made to the people of Israel that were passed along to Moses, and now they were passed along to Joshua. That's the first chapter. Chapter 2 and 3, it's talking about, okay, how do we get to reclaim, to make those promises ours for the people of God? Chapter 4 to chapter 12 talks about everything that happened in that process, which is, like I said, it's, it's an incredible experience to do that. Right there on chapter 10, there's one of the most incredible declarations, I think, and when I'm reading that, I was thinking, no wonder God said many, many times to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Many times, be strong and courageous. I only ask you to be strong and courageous. Because one of those verses says that the sun stop in the middle of the sky and delay go down for a full day. And it reads on verse 14, there has never been a day like it before or since. Wow. That's the word of the Lord. That's what it's saying. And then chapter 12 to chapter 22, it talks about all the distribution of the land that God has given as inheritance to the people of God. Chapter 22 and 24 is Joshua getting all the assembly of the people of God to remind them the importance to remain faithful to the Lord, to the God who just gave them the inheritance of this land. Very impressive, very interesting story. And so I want to I wanna use his story, like I said. That's the survey of the, the entire book. Obviously, I'm not going to preach on the entire book, or so you hope. Um, so I just want to touch a little base on the first chapter, and then I'm, we're going to move to chapter 3. Because I want to show you the promises God made to the people so that you understand what I'm talking about. So chapter 1, verse 1, and the Word of God reads in this way. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River in the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot. 
Let me read that again. I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to the Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country and the Mediterranean Sea and all the West. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Wow. Amen. That's the right place to say amen. Because these words were said to them, were said to them but guess what? They are said to you too this morning. I wish that you hear God saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you always. Just be strong and courageous. Amen. So that's the promise God gave to the people. Like I said, the same way he gave it to them, he has given it to us. And so now I want to move a little bit, uh, fast forward to chapter 3, because now that they have the promise, now they have to act upon that promise. Amen? So chapter 3, verse 11, uh, God is now giving instructions to Joshua and the people of how are they going, how are they going to go about claiming that promise. They have the, the, the 40 years in the desert are gone. They uh, already have some inheritance of the land of the, on the west, on the east of the river. The half tribe of Manasseh and uh, the Reubenites and the other tribe have already received their inheritance in there. Now they have been uh, made a promise that although they're on this side of the river, they will come to aid the other tribes in order to reclaim this promise. A hundred thousand people from those tribes got their inheritance on the east side of the river. But now 40,000 are going to come to aid the others. And this is how the word reads as God gives instructions to the people. See, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. As soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage, all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carry the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap in a, a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Sarepta. While the waters flowing down to the sea of the Arabah, which is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite to Jericho. The priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. So they have received the promise and now they have to take it. They have to make it theirs. So I want to point at least three things on this passage. Did you hear that said that the Jordan River was a flood stage? Normally, the Jordan River is just a stream of water. Now, in this particular time, it's a flood stage. Do you wonder, Lord, why did you ask us to come? Why didn't you ask us to come during summer when there is just a little river? But we have to come right now when it's so inconvenient. I mean, it's just a big stream of water. You know what? God normally chooses things like that to work in our lives. Not in the most convenient time, at least on our own view. But that's the first challenge they have to endure. They have to uh, face. They have the promise, but they have the first challenge. The second one, 
They have to actually step in the river before the miracle happens. Now, we don't like that, right? We want the miracle happen first, and then I can move because it's safe. Again, that's not the way God works. This is not the first time God has chooses to work in this way. As a matter of fact, this is the way He always chooses to work. Because He wants that we know, that we understand it's about Him and it's not about us. Remember I talked to you about the 40,000 warriors from the half-tribe of Manasseh? The reason that they were in leading the procession is because they were strong warriors. But God wanted to make sure that they did not thought this was on their own power. This was God's power at work. Did you notice that it says in the, in the final part of the text that it was dry ground? We normally miss that miracle. And you may think, well, is this metaphorically speaking or is this real? Because as you can imagine, the river being stopped uh, way at a distance, the, 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 set, the, the, the river bed was still wet. And yet it says that they crossed on dry, on dry ground. Don't miss that miracle. It's God's power at work. Like I said, obviously, He's using the presence of the ark. There's no longer a, a, a pillar of fire to uh, carry on them at night or a cloud to lead them during the day. Now is the Ark of the Covenant, and it's obviously that God is using that as a way to show them that it's because of His power that the water is yielding to Him, and not about them. It's about God, it's not about them. So the reason I want to I wanna bring that out to you is because that's, like I said, the way which normally God will operate with us. He will give us a promise. We will have some obstacles. We will have some challenges. But the promise of God will always be fulfilled. Amen. It depends on us if we are strong and courageous. If we can do what it takes to overcome the obstacle. So based on that... The fundamental question I have to ask this morning as you, as you and I think about a strong future is, can you trust God to keep His promises? That is the bottom line. That is the, the thing that will wrestle with you your entire life. Can I trust God? Can I trust God even today? Interestingly, when uh, this, this whole book of Joshua is, uh, was written, Joshua is a young man. At chapter 24, he is a grown-up man. He's 110 years old. He's ready to go and die and go on with the Lord. And that chapter 23, verse 14 says, Now I am about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart, and so that not one of all the good promises of the Lord your God gave you has failed. Not one. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Wow. Now think about your own life. Does your life show that you trust God? When the people see the way you face your problems, your trials, your uh, challenges, does the people know and understand that your trust is in the God most high? Mahatma Gandhi said once, to believe in something and not to live it is dishonest. Evidently then, um, a very important ingredient for a strong foundation has to do with faith. Because Hebrews 11 uh, verse 1 says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence. 
It is the testimony. It is the proof of things we cannot see. Now, I, I want to talk about three concepts that as I was preparing my message, I was wrestling if I needed to speak with this. Because normally I don't like to speak with these big words, but I think it's just um, unavoidable for this morning. And in order to start doing that, I'm going to make a test of all of you. Okay? So I will ask from all of you to think on a pink elephant. You got it? You have it in your mind? Yeah? Okay, I've never seen a pink elephant, right? Now, I've seen elephants, and I know the color pink, right? So I can put those together in my mind and create a concept that although it doesn't exist, I can make it through my imagination. Are we on? Are we agree? Okay. Second test. Think of nothing. You can. I see your faces. Because at the moment I say, think of something, you're trying to, to think, okay, what, what is nothing? An empty space is not nothing. It's just a space that is empty. The problem with thinking about nothing is that it's a concept that is out of our rational capacity. We can't think of nothing. We don't know what does that look like. Now, Hebrews Chapter 11, verse, verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed out of God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. There is a word for that, and that is the word ex nihilo. Ex nihilo is the Latin phrase meaning out of nothing. It, like I said, is a concept that escapes our rational ability. We can think of nothing. We don't know what that is. So first concept, ex nihilo. The second is anthropomorphism. The anthropomorphism is the way we can relate to God. Meaning, we give God form. So we give God the, uh, 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 an appearance of human so that we can relate to him. Kind of like what we, what we read when we say, um, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand. Does God have a hand? Or when he says that he was walking in... Does he have feet? By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth. All these characteristics we give to God are just so that we can put a rational concept in our mind to understand who God is. Ex nihilo, anthropomorphous. And the last one is that God exists out of time, out of the concept of time. He is not bound by our past, our present, or our future. Revelation 1 verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who it was and will and it will be. I am the Almighty. God's, pres God's future, God's past, is the present and is the future all at once. Now, why are those, these concepts important for us to understand? Or not even to understand, but at least to acknowledge them. To make peace with them. Because once we understand the way God works and the way God operates, it's beyond our own comprehension, then we can start understanding His Word. Then we can make room in our own life to hear what God has to say. Proverbs verse three, verse five, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Do not use your rational to understand God, to believe in what He says. You know, I, I, I hear people all the time saying, Oh, trust your heart, trust your, trust your God, trust, trust what, what it seems right. You know how many times the Bible says, Don't do that! The heart is the last thing you should trust. The heart is deceitful. 
Depending on where I am, I feel that I got everything that I need right now until I change. Don't do that. In all your ways, submit to Him. And look what happens when we do that. And He will make your path straight. Praise God for Him. Praise God for His words. Praise God that He gives us direction and, we, and He doesn't just leave us abandoned to our own devices, to our own uh, inventiveness of how to go on in our lives. He gives us a clear direction. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lead not in your own understanding. Isaiah 43 verse 9 says, See, I am doing a new thing. Can you perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness. If you allow me to refrain that, I am making a way where there is none. That's the way God operates in our life. That's what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. I don't need to see what's in front of me as long as He does. That's the way we are called to live. We can trust our own abilities. God sees the big picture. That's why when we pray, I say, Lord, this is what I want. This is what I think is the best. But may your will be done in my life because you have the picture on this entirely. My view is so tunnel, it's so focused on this moment. And what I want now, I don't know how it's going to affect me in the future. But you do. You hold the future. A.W. Tozer says, Any faith that must be supported by the evidence of the senses is not real faith. If we can explain how do things happen, it's not real faith. So we need faith. We have God's promises. We know we're going to endure some challenges. But the, the important thing is to, that we need to know is that His promises will always will be fulfilled. We need faith. We understand what is faith. We understand that in order to have faith, we have to go beyond our own abilities. Now, there's two extremes that happen with faith. One of them is that when we go to trials, our enemy only has to do one thing. He just has to plan the sea of doubt. Did God really say? Did God really say this? Can I really trust God today? Are those words really for me? Have you ever experienced that? When you go through trials in your life, when you go through difficulties, when you are able to see your past, can you remember that, that time when you, when you wrestled with that doubt, when that, when, when that doubt came into your mind and you thought, I don't know if I can make it out of this one. I don't know if I can go through. Now, the interesting thing about that is in the past, we can see, and, I, and, and in my own personal life, when, I, when I've gone through difficult, dark times of our lives, I know what it means that even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, He is with me. That's one extreme. The other one extreme is that when we know and we understand faith, and we understand that God is trustworthy. That's the only thing that we can hold on to keep on with our lives. That's the reason, or that's the only reason I can see somebody who has endured an extreme challenge, like losing a son or a daughter, and still smile the next day. Maybe something extreme is losing your business, losing your pension, because that's where your future lies. That's where your trust is. And then you're forced to trust. 
Because faith is not faith until it is the only thing that sustains us. When you have a difficult diagnosis to deal with, that we can rely on science, then we grab hold to the Word of God, to His promises, that His will is always better than what we think it is. I don't know what, what are your own experiences. My own experiences in life, when I've, when I've gone through difficult times where I don't see a way, that's the only thing that has kept me going. To know that God is with me. That although I don't understand, that although I can see a way, but God has made a way where there is no way. Amen? I want to finish with this. Isaiah chapter 43. The word of God says, but I want you to hear it from him, from God himself as he's speaking to you, as he's telling you these things. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. I said in the service early this morning <clears throat> that this week, uh, as you know, Pastor Virales is in um, Jerusalem today, I think. And I haven't been to the hospital so many times as I have this week. Uh, while, while there are other things to care here, in, here on campus. So many people ill. We hear of people uh, fighting diseases. We hear of our own people dealing with loss, having to travel to bury their loved ones. I have a friend who is a missionary in Thailand. I don't know how many of you heard about a shooting that uh, happened. And she leads this orphanage and they have to leave with the children to hide them in a safe place after what happened. And the reason I bring that up is because we are so easily to caught up in our own reality. In our own thing right here and forget what is going on out there. As Monica said in her prayer, we're about uh, a days from um, remembering a tragedy that we all feel right here in our community on February 14. Do we have faith? Do we understand that God's promises are still applicable to us, even in the midst of everything that is going on? Even in the midst of chaos, those words still are applicable to us. I hope you take these words and you act upon them, meaning you live the way you, you say you trust. That your trust is evidence, is evident for all the people that sees the way you live.